I have seen a massive shift over the past couple of years that has seen like actually that be more of a focus rather than the actual software engineering side of it. Hello guys, welcome back to part two of my Ask Me Anything video series. Basically, a few weeks back, I asked everyone to ask me questions on LinkedIn and I would answer them in a YouTube video. And so that's what this series is about. I was initially only gonna do this in two parts, but I might have to do it in three because I have had a lot of questions and yeah, basically that is why. So without further ado, I know you're itching to get into it, so let's get started. So the first thing that we're gonna be covering today is a question by Tudor, which basically says, what would you do if you were to restart your career? And so I think if I was to restart my career now, I would definitely put a lot more focus into the data engineering and the data analytics side. I have seen a massive shift over the past couple of years that has seen like actually that be more of a focus rather than the actual software engineering side of it. I definitely think the software engineering side of it is still really, really important, but I would just say it's such an more of an equal split now versus what back when I started. I can see like things like the infrastructure side is slowly getting to a point where it's like actually quite stable and quite good. So a lot of like our shift, especially at Microsoft, is the data engineering and the data analytics side and, and building ETL pipelines. So that is something that I would probably do differently if I was going to be starting today, for example. I'd be trying to get somewhere where I can learn a little bit more about the data engineering side. The other thing that I would probably be doing is I wouldn't get so hung up on just learning one language. So for example, when I started I pretty much did C sharp for the first five years of my career and now I work with Python, React, Go, like Terraform, Bicep, loads of different languages basically and I would probably try and get comfortable with doing that a little bit earlier because I think that really really increased my growth as a software engineer getting familiar with working with different languages. That's not to say when you're starting out you should absolutely do that. It's always important to get at least good enough in one language before we start venturing off into other ones but like definitely Definitely after like a couple years in, I would definitely have like got more comfortable learning in different languages. For example, like Python, I found really, really good for working with data structure and algorithms. And like before, I've always found it really awkward to do in C Sharp. So it's just little things like that. So I definitely put more of a focus on being like language agnostic and just being able to understand the theory of, of software engineering and solving problems, but focusing on a language that I find that most comfortable to do in. The next question is from Habib. What is the future of Blazor in the market? So I actually think Blazor has quite a big future in the market and the reason why is because it really bridges a gap for .NET engineers. .NET and C Sharp engineers just don't really like working with other languages. They just love working with C Sharp and if they can avoid like learning another framework or another language such as React or JavaScript, they absolutely will. So I think there's been a lot of investment into creating Blazor to make it a seamless experience. I've been working on it recently myself and I find it really nice to work with. If you are a C Sharp .NET developer, it's really, really easy to kind of get familiar with it. You don't have to be this UI um, front end expert to get good at it. There's a lot of free libraries that you can use as well for like components that you can use. And so that's what is really, really good about it. Personally though, I would probably still work with React as my first choice just because I've done a lot of React so far. But I can understand why if someone hasn't really worked with other like front end languages before and they are a team where they are just working like predominantly back end but they like just need to start creating a simple front end for what they're doing I can see why it's going to be used for that possibly not for like really really complex front ends like I, I don't know I'm not a front end engineer but it does the job for a lot of websites and if it does the job and it allows like C sharp dot net engineers to get up and run quickly like of course it's a good option David asks what should the next big Microsoft product bring out be and should it be a web or a desktop app so I'm not not sure what they should definitely bring out but it should definitely be a web app rather than a desktop app whatever it is I just think like desktop is becoming such an obsolete thing now and web just is able to work on so many different browsers rather than working on one machine and web is just so much more like compatible with different browsers versus most desktop apps which either work on Windows or work on Mac but like it's very difficult to get to them to work on both and so I definitely think any sort of new like products going forward should be web apps unless there's some reason why they can't be. And then the other thing that I would say is that like I think a lot of Microsoft's focus isn't necessarily on creating new products, it's on how do we integrate AI to make our work so much easier. So just things like one thing that I would love to see for example
example is I would love to see in Azure DevOps and in GitHub ways to easily generate user stories and to easily generate test cases and to use AI to basically do the tasks that we don't really find that enjoyable and so I would love to see more of that within our products. I would love to see like GitHub Copilot just getting generally better at writing tests for us. I would love to see like you know test cases generation easily in GitHub and in Azure DevOps. Just things that can take a lot of time and are quite repetitive tasks. Removing the manual work and using AI to automate that would be great to see. Rahul asks how as a developer you learn new skill. I know we can refer to docs but sometimes I get stuck or docs seem unorganized. How in situations can you get out of that? And so there's a few different techniques what you can do when the docs aren't great. One thing that I often do when the docs aren't great and I'm like connecting to the, and I have the ability to have the source code, is I would pull the source code down and see whether or not I can run any tests, if there's any tests there. If there are tests there, then I can use those tests to debug my actual application. So I can say, okay, I'm gonna put breakpoints in my application and I'm gonna step through and see what it's doing. If that isn't possible, I could do is use something like Postman and like connect the and get the API points basically set up on, on Postman and basically just see like what like what is happening whenever I do a, a specific request and with specific data. So really it's just about inspecting the code yourself and whether or not like you can see like any patterns emerging from that code and stepping through the code as well. So when I came into my last company, one of the first things that I did to understand the actual system because there was very, very limited documentation was documentation documented the payment flow and so I would basically I stepped through the code and I basically drew what happened when a payment was made and there were various different things that happened when a payment was made things like okay discounts were checked gift cards were checked like card validation was checked then emails were sent out transactions were made so there's a lot of different things that were happening in the flow of a payment being made and take like deducted from the person balance and so I just basically drew it out like okay these are the services that we've got and how do we actually like integrate with the services from this endpoint? What about from this endpoint? What about from this endpoint? And that made a clear picture for me personally on how the system works. It's definitely more difficult when you're working with third party tools because you have to basically figure out what inputs it likes and what inputs it doesn't basically by trial and error. I could definitely talk a lot more about this so if you want a separate video on how to basically make sense of a system where the documentation is lacking or the documentation isn't great let me know and I can absolutely do that they're just the high level things that I would do um, when trying to get familiar with a system that I haven't worked with before and is not the best documented so the next question is by Hassan and it's quite a long question so I'll let you read it but basically it's just saying they've been out of the industry for a while they've been out of the industry for two years since they've graduated how do they get their foot back in the door and then they've given a little bit of brief explanation of what like their situation is and then yeah what would I do if I was in that position so I'm not sure whether or not I would do like a master's or anything like that I'd see if there's any opportunity to maybe do like a boot camp or something I know that like in the UK for example boot camps are usually like government funded in order to get you up and running and that can be a great way to like at least like if you've done a degree before which is computer science focused just to get re-familiarized with what it is that you like were doing before however if that isn't an option then then I would probably focus on the following areas. I'd focus on um, upskilling again in data structure and algorithms. I'd focus on building my portfolio of projects for things that like I can then add to my CV. So I have something to explain for the gap that I've had, but I have still been doing like actual active work over the last few months. And then I would also be like networking and connecting with people on LinkedIn, just so that they can see that I'm interested in the things that I'm doing. It's definitely gonna be like, it's not gonna be an instant thing when you've had had a bit of a career break and you want to get back into it it does take a few months to ramp back up and get familiar with what it is that you were doing and and the skills that you've lost since like not being able to use them for a while but it is definitely possible to do either on your own or to use some sort of like 
government funded option like to help you like revamp your skills for example and that is what I would do the next one is Mohammed and he asked basically like what are like the coding practices of code access for Microsoft and like is there anything we do for like ensuring like we keep our code safe I'll let you read the actual question properly and that is just what I basically understood the question to mean it's quite a long question and so that's that's how I'm going to answer it so Microsoft like you don't necessarily get access to every single code base when you're working at Microsoft. You get access to the projects that you're on or the products that you're on. You don't get access to someone else's. So for example, I don't have access to the majority of Microsoft products um, code bases because I don't need access to the majority of Microsoft code bases. So that's quite tightly controlled. I'm, I'm not entirely sure like what like would happen um, if in terms someone copied someone's code and then put it onto their personal machines like once you've cloned it. We do have to access everything, access company resources through the company VPN. So I'm not sure if that means that it would be audited. I assume it would be. But like, to be honest, like, I think because it's quite tightly controlled in how like you access things, that it just means that most people aren't like accessing certain resources. Oops, sorry, my phone cut out there. I am just going to carry on with where I left off. Basically, I'm just going to summarize what I just said in my previous question. It's basically one, we do access everything through the VPN, and so I assume that that does the like access controls there. Two, we only get access to projects that we like work on actively. So we don't get access to all the different projects in Microsoft. So that's another way of like reducing the access control of what we need to access because we don't need to access all the different projects and products that are out there. And three, I assume but can't verify that the products that are quite like secret and sensitive and new are like kept under like tight restrictions rather than like being able to be accessed by anybody for example and that's pretty much it I'm probably not the best person to ask about this because I just haven't really like done the research on it it's not something that I would ever do so like why would I like research it kind of thing and then that brings me on to my final question will I fix Microsoft Teams no but for real like please be patient like Microsoft Teams like the new one has just come out recently and it is having a few growing pains and like if you think like it is like supporting millions and millions of users so it is a challenge to get it is a challenge to that Ugh. It is a challenge to get to that scalability. However, as well, just try and not like associate it with the old teams because it is a completely different product in the terms of how it's built. And so I am hopeful that it's going to be built like better. And also like just in terms of like over the last few months, we've had it on our machines. Like we, we have it before other people have it to, to try it out internally. And I have seen like gradual improvements of it. So just like pray and like hope that it, you're gonna see those two like within the next few months to come. And that's all from me. If you like this video, please can you give it a thumbs up and subscribe. I post weekly content on my YouTube and on my blog, and I also post daily content on my LinkedIn. Thank you for watching.